Greg Schiano, can you do it again? Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, breaking down the schedule for every team in the Power Five and also giving you a spring record projection. Not necessarily my final prediction, but my record projection for that particular team. We go to the bottom of the Big Ten and arguably the bottom of Power Five football, and I believe that to be the case, especially among the Power Five conferences, not necessarily taking in the really bad independent programs like a UMass that Rutgers played and beat by 27 points in 2019. But this has been the poster child for a dumpster fire over the past three or four seasons in college football. Rutgers. Rutgers moving to the Big Ten has been a joke, a complete joke. They have been mismatched in the Big Ten and annihilated. But I mentioned Greg Schiano off the top of the video, of course, after a head coaching stint at Tampa Bay, defensive coordinator job at Ohio State, almost a hire at Tennessee, but a backlash on social media kept him from taking that job and being finally offered that job in Knoxville. Greg Schiano's back at the place that made his name, at Rutgers. Rutgers has basically had a deplorable college football history. And it's ironic because Rutgers played in and won the very first collegiate football game way back in whenever that was, 1850, something in that range. 150 yards, 150 years of college football, so about 1870. I believe 1869 was the year. Yes, 1869 was the year that Rutgers played in the very first, what is considered to be the first, college football game. And then fast forward 150 years later, it appears as though they've made absolutely no progress in their understanding of the game. But when Greg Schiano, who's now the new head coach, the old new head coach at Rutgers, when he was at Rutgers, basically the Scarlet Knights enjoyed their biggest success, their most sustained success during the time in which uh, they've been a football program, at least during modern co collegiate football. Uh, Greg Schiano only went 68 and 67 at Rutgers and finished 20 games under 500 in conference play, but it took him some time to get the things going. Uh, over his final five or six seasons, he finished 21 games over 500, regularly had Rutgers in bowl play, competing for Big East championships, competing for Big East championships going to bowl games again, and he finished at 9-4 and four before he was offered a head coaching job in the NFL in which he lasted for two seasons. All right, Chiano's back, and his football personnel is awful. So I would expect Rutgers to be drastically improved just because of his sheer presence, confidence, structure in building a program, and organizing and galvanizing a team. They're going to compete. They're going to be markedly better. But is that going to result in wins? No, because they got blasted by just so many points in the last few years that they're going to start turning 50-point losses into four touchdown losses. They're going to start turning those four touchdown losses into two-score losses. They're going to be markedly better, I would expect, under Shiano, but it's not going to translate into wins and losses this year. It will continue to translate just into losses. They were 2-10, 0-9 in the Big Ten last year, coming off another 0-9 the season before in the Big Ten. I'm going to leave some statistics down below uh, in the video that will outline how awful Rutgers football has been since joining the Big Ten in 2014. They've been completely overwhelmed by the Big Ten Eastern Division in particular. A quick recap of 2019, Rutgers got off to a good start. They beat UMass maybe the worst team in the Power Five, 48-21. 27-point win in Game 1 in Piscataway over UMass. In Big Ten play, they lost to Iowa by 30. They lost to Michigan by 52. They lost to Maryland. Maryland won one game in the Big Ten. Maryland went 3-9, and nine and they beat Rutgers by 41. That's how bad the Scarlet Knights were under Kyle Flood. They lost to Indiana, 35 to nothing. If you want to see an inept offensive box score. Go to last year, October 13th, 2019. Go to the box score of Indiana Rutgers and look at Rutgers' offensive output against Indiana. I believe they passed for negative yardage in that game. Passed for negative yardage. That seems nearly impossible. It is, but they accomplished it against the Hoosiers. Not against Clemson, against Indiana. 
They lost to Minnesota by 35. They beat Liberty. That was their non-conference win over Liberty, which goes to show you the difference between uh, a Power 5 independent, not named Notre Dame or BYU, and even the worst of the Power 5 in conference play coming out of the Big Ten. Rutgers beat Liberty, a Liberty team that won a bowl game or went to a bowl game, beat them by 10. All right, they lost to Illinois by 28. They lost to Ohio State by 35, which was a moral victory that they lost to the Buckeyes by 35. Of course, Ohio State could have named the score. That didn't much matter. And then they finished the season losing to Michigan State by 27, and Penn State took it easy on Rutgers, winning by 21. All right, let's move on to 2020. So the W's are pretty much sure wins, the L's are pretty much sure losses, and the T's stand for toss-up, even though I don't necessarily mean toss-up as in 50-50 toss-up. I mean that the game is in question, is in doubt. All right, so if Rutgers can't beat uh, Monmouth to start the season, they might as well pack it in and just call it a day. So they got to win that game. Then they've got uh, Syracuse, and they've got Temple on the road. Both of those are winnable games. I would expect that Rutgers is going to be a double-digit underdog against both of those teams, should lose both of those games, but I think they're winnable. I think that they've got a 15-20% to 20 chance of winning those games against Syracuse and Temple. The Cuse was not good last year at 5-7, didn't beat anybody good, and Temple was a better team than that, but they lost to North Carolina in the bowl game 55-13. So Rutgers could possibly, it would be a victory, certainly. It would be a huge mark of progress if they would win one of those games. They've got Ohio State on the road. They've got Illinois at home. Illinois, of course, went to a bowl game last year under Lovey Smith. I would expect them to regress a little bit. Uh, Rutgers, if they're going to win a game in Big Ten play, it's going to be against Illinois, number one, or it's going to be this game coming down uh, in College Park against Maryland on the road. Even though it's a road game, going to College Park is not necessarily daunting. So they've got Ohio State, Illinois, Purdue, Indiana, Nebraska, Maryland, and they finish off with Michigan, Michigan State, and Penn State. Interesting strategy by the Big Ten and their approach in scheduling the final weekend. Of course, the final weekend of college football means rivalry weekend. Ohio State, Michigan. So in the Big Ten, it means Ohio State, Michigan, Purdue, Indiana. Uh, it's been in the past uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, as it was last year, or for Paul Bunyan's axe. Uh, we've got uh, the Iowa-Nebraska game, and now they've switched that up. But Northwestern Illinois, obviously, being the two teams in state there. Uh, it's been the Big Ten's objective to make Penn State and Michigan State rivals. They played on the final weekend of the season every year since Penn State joined the Big Ten, up until a couple years ago. And it appeared as though the Big Ten was trying to force Rutgers and Maryland together on that final weekend and make them rivals. But then they must have figured, okay, they look like the stepchildren. They're playing each other every weekend on the final weekend every year. And so they've mixed up this rotation, and it's kind of strange where it's either Michigan State Rutgers, Penn State Maryland, or it's Penn State Maryland, and Michigan State Rutgers because those four teams don't really have a natural rival. So this year it's a Penn State Rutgers game on the final weekend, and of course Penn State's going to be a huge favorite in that one. I love to look at the non-conference games. Obviously they separate the schedules. And then also who do you play in the other division? So in the Big Ten, you got 14 teams, you got nine conference games, so you play three of the seven teams in the other division. So it's key, not necessarily for Rutgers because they can't beat anyone, but it's key among the contenders who you play in the other division. So for Rutgers, again, it's Illinois, Purdue, and Nebraska. So they miss the better teams in the Western Division, Iowa, Wisconsin, and Minnesota, but does it really matter at this point? Greg Schiano probably wishes they would play the really tough teams in the West because then they would face the lesser teams like this when his team might be a little bit more competitive in a few years. It's going to take Greg Schiano some time to dig out of this hole. We'll see if he's up to the challenge, but expect Rutgers to be improved, but it not necessarily to show up in the win column this year. Coming off 2-10, 0-9 in the Big Ten, expect them to go 2-10 again 
but maybe a win in the Big Ten this year. I'm going to go one win in the Big Ten for the Rutgers Scarlet Knights. Maybe they beat Illinois. Maybe they win at College Park against the Terps. Would love to get your thoughts on Rutgers football for 2020 right here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. Please like, comment, share the videos out on social media. If you are brave enough to share a Rutgers video on social media, and then, of course, uh, join us for our live streams. Uh, Monday night, I got a call-in show, uh, rather that Sunday night call-in show, Sunday night at 10 o'clock Eastern Time, and, of course, Friday at noon right here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football.